Uh, my name is Tim Carter, president of, of Second Nature. And as many of you know, Second Nature is uh, an organization committed to accelerating climate action through higher education. Uh, for the past 13 years, we've run the uh, Higher Education's Climate Leadership Network, which is the largest and longest standing network of institutions that have voluntarily committed to carbon neutrality in any sector in the world. So we're really proud of that. Of course, we think we punch above our weight as a network organization. Um, and we, we try to expand that scope and the impact of our network uh, uh, globally. Uh, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to introduce what we're here to talk about uh, and then turn it over to our, our panelists. Um, I'm an ecologist, and I've been, I've been trained in systems thinking. And so what that means for us at Second Nature is that we don't merely define climate action as a technological problem or a technical, with a technological solution or a problem of political will uh, or an election. And, you know, all these things matter, of course, but uh, they're not the, the only way we're going to tackle and address this challenge that we face. Uh, it's a problem with our systems. And, uh, and therefore, we at the heart of any set of solutions, we really have to be committed to systems thinking and connections between society's systems. And I think today what we want to discuss and the reason we brought this panel together was to really think about connections between current systems that may not be as, as uh, upfront as what people may uh, think about. And that's specifically the current COVID crisis that we're in. Um, additionally, you know, there's more recent elevation of, of uh, systemic racism and how justice is connected to climate action. So these are really, these connections are really at the core of what we do. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So before turning it over to, uh, to President Nunez, I did want to take a second and thank the staff of MIT. Whenever you do a webinar, you kind of have to rely on, well, of course, MIT to pull it off. Um, of course, Eastern Connecticut um, was, it was great to have um, your support and Secretary Kerry and your staff. Um, we're really appreciative for, uh, for making this event happen. Um, we're also hoping that, that this event will actually stimulate everyone's thinking and action for the future. So th this do we're not considering this a one and done, but we'd rather have this uh, as, as a starting point for high level conversations around the role that higher education plays in helping solve the climate crisis. So go to secondnature.org, you can see um, all of our current offerings, uh, but then also reach out to us and let us know about ideas you might have for future events based on the the inspiration you might find today. So thank you all for attending and, uh, and thank you to uh, our participants. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Elsa Nunez, who's president of uh, Eastern Connecticut State University. Elsa, floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. It's an honor to facilitate, facilitate this session. And I wanna start by thanking Tim and uh, the Second Nature staff for putting the uh, webinar together, the idea, and then of course the execution. Um, Tim is passionate about climate change and uh, his work is systematic and deep. And this webinar was his thinking primarily with his staff to try to get us to think about uh, how the sector of higher education can redefine ourselves in order to solve society's great challenges. A big task, we only have one hour, we'll get as far as we can and as deep as we can into the subject. Uh, I also want to send my uh, appreciation out to the staff of MIT, to the staff of Second Nature, and of course, uh, Secretary Kerry staff, who all were very, very supportive in getting us to this point. If you've ever pulled this off, a big event like this, you know that it's it looks easy, and all these people behind the scenes have done a lot, a lot to get us here, so thank you. I thought a little bit about my introduction, and then I said, these two men, these two distinguished panelists need very little introduction. It is my honor and privilege to introduce them to the audience today. Uh, Secretary Kerry, your work as a, a state senator for decades, and then your, your uh, impressive work as Secretary of State under President Obama made us all admire you even more. All of the work that you've done, and now as a private citizen with climate at the core of, of one of your pillars, you've been a, a public servant that has served this country and this world very well. Thank you for joining us today. And President Reif, uh, you have uh, a Venezuelan by, by uh, birth and uh, 
an electrical engineer by training, a distinguished scholar, author, and researcher. Uh, I read about your work when you led the faculty at MIT to discuss issues of race and diversity, and you ably led that discussion, a complicated discussion. And now as president, through your efforts to create institutes and centers of excellence to deal with the global challenges, particularly in the area of climate, have been impressive. So the two of you together have written about how the COVID crisis and climate have so many things in common and how we can learn from all of, all of the uh, work that both of you have done in these areas. So thank you for being here. To the audience, I say thank you for joining us. And there's a chat function. You're all Zoom experts, and you know how to use the chat function. I'll be looking at the questions, and I'll be inserting some of your questions into the questions that we've already prepared for this session. So welcome to everyone. Now, one of the things that I've learned as president, and I've been president 15 years, is that I try to have a notebook next to my uh, uh, you know, on my desk next to the computer, and I try to say, what have I learned from this terrible experience? <laughs> Usually there's a, some terrible experience. Mm -hmm. And the virus, uh, COVID-19, has been one of those in which I've been jotting down uh, so many of the challenges that I'm facing. And so all of us know that what has happened to us socially, economically, and culturally uh, has left us with with many, many questions about how the country and the world will continue to deal with it. But what lessons have you learned from the, the crisis that we're in? And, why, what, and the crisis that we have with the climate as well, when these two crises are put together in the way that they are right now in the world and in our country, what would you tell the audience you've learned from it? And I'm gonna start with you, Secretary Kerry, and then from then on, we'll alternate who goes first and who goes second, if that's okay. <clears throat> oh, it's absolutely okay. Thank you, Elsa, very, very much. And thank you for taking time to moderate this today. And uh, I think we all appreciate uh, your leadership of a special school, the third oldest uh, public university in the state and home to the Institute for Sustainable Energy. So uh, we thank you for your leadership, particularly. Tim, thank you for uh, Second Nature, uh, which I had the privilege of helping to found along with uh, uh, Tony Cortese, who spent years there working at it. And, and you're carrying on and it's wonderful to see you doing that. And a particular uh, thanks to uh, Rafael Reif for uh, his voice in this dialogue and the extraordinary leadership that he brought to uh, MIT uh, and I want to just thank you. Uh, I was delighted, obviously, when MIT and Harvard took the Trump administration to court over the abuse of foreign students. And uh, you won a big victory, which I, I hoped you would win, uh, not just for the campuses, but uh, for every campus in the country, and I think for our reputation in the world. So thank you and congratulations for that. Let me just make uh, a couple quick points about lessons learned. There, there, there are a lot of lessons here. And uh, President Reif and I both wrote some publicly. Um, but let me, let me draw what I think are the most important ones. Um, first of all, there is the lesson that some things in the course of public events and challenges to nation states can only be dealt with uh, in a upfront way that deals with science, experts, reality, uh, and where the government, number one, must speak with one clear, disciplined voice, uh, which is the exact opposite of what has happened here. So unfortunately, President Trump was busy trying to get a trade deal that's a phony trade deal, as it put us back basically where we were at the very beginning of this four-year exercise. But uh, he was so busy buttering up President Xi, telling how transparent China was and how wonderful they'd responded even when we knew otherwise, that uh, it uh, allowed them uh, to get away with something and, it and it, he totally avoided responsibility for dealing with what was the reality. Uh, secondly, um, uh, you, you have to tell the truth about these things. You can't be telling people it's a hoax and four months later put on a mask 
when scientists are telling you that 78 or 79 percent of the of the um, passing of this virus, uh, which happens to be, I am told from Dr. Fauci and others, the single most voracious, uh, uh, contagious virus that ever confronted, uh, that 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 you 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 cannot have a president of the United States set an example for people not having a mask and then making it into a political issue. And so we've been divided, unlike the America that most of us know and love, that when it meets a real challenge, we step up in a bipartisan way and we deal with facts and we, 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 we make something happen. So that is an enormous uh, uh, lesson out of this, obviously. The next lesson is uh, that we cannot allow people to stand up as they are now and say, well, we can't afford to make this change or that change. We have to get the economy back where it was and we have to move forward. And there's just no way to deal with that issue while we're dealing with the other issues. And then they'll say, well, Black Lives Matter. Black, we've got to deal with Black Lives Matter. Well, nobody involved with Black Lives Matter believes that you should separate the two or that the United States is incapable of doing two things at the same time. So the same excuse that has driven this debate, and I've been involved in this debate for 35 years, 40 years. I've worked on acid rain when I was a United States Senator. In fact, we solved the problem of acid rain uh, by creating a trading mechanism, something that's a third rail of American politics today. You couldn't talk about a market-based trading mechanism. Uh, so you have to uh, admit the reality that there's certain behavior that people are saying you have to engage in to deal with climate change. And I think one of the great mistakes of the climate movement, uh, the environment movement, is that it has allowed this to be too much of a behavioral debate and not a sufficiently scientific debate. So there are things we know about coronavirus, but there's a lot we don't know about it. And yet we're doing things. We tell people to change, you know, wash their hands, to wear a mask, to shelter at home, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, their whole series of, 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 behave, of, of social distancing and so forth. But we, we, we haven't turned it into a behavioral debate. Why? Because it is so visibly dangerous. It's killing people now. And climate change is sort of still out there for people so that the debate is centered more on the behavior. Oh, you can't eat meat, or you can't, you know, you gotta close your window, you gotta change your heat, you can't do this or that. Rather than focusing on the scientific choices and the expertise that is staring us in the face that says, this is even more dangerous than coronavirus. Climate crisis is more dangerous than coronavirus because it will create more pandemics. It's not a singular event. It's multiple events, including refugees, food disruption, water disruption. Uh, and, and I have the privilege of negotiating, leading the negotiating team in Paris and negotiating with President Xi to bring the Chinese on board to deal with this. I can tell you that, uh, it, 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 that, that, that we knew when we left Paris, we were not guaranteeing that the temperature of the earth would be held to a two degree centigrade or let alone a 1.5 degree centigrade rise. We knew we were gonna, if you did everything in the Paris Agreement, we're still rising to 3.7 degrees, folks. And the truth is we're not doing everything. So in fact, we are heading to 4.1 to 4.5 degrees right now and getting worse. Before COVID, every single country in the world was gonna see its emissions go up, not down. So the challenge here is getting away, you know, re re resuscitating in America, a debate that is based on science, on facts, on expertise, and not allowing demagogues and liars to step in the way of the truth in a country that prides itself for telling the truth. And that was built on the notion that the truth is what ultimately sets us free. So there are other lessons, but I think those are the most consequential. The one that goes with it is, We've behaved the opposite of this, but it is clear to everyone of common sense that there's only one way to solve this problem ultimately, it is globally. And yet the United States of America is doing the exact opposite, insulting leaders, 
praising demagogues who are on the opposite side of the issue, and worse, uh, pulling out of the WHO and pulling out of the Paris Agreement. So we're at a very, very dangerous, critical moment for our nation. And all of those things accumulated should underscore to everybody uh, the lessons that I've just laid out. And the biggest lesson of all is we know enough. We know enough. We deal with coronavirus because we know enough. And we're not dealing with climate when we also know enough. So those are the lessons, at least for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Before President Reif responds, I just want to remind everybody that, that below your video window, there there's a panel and you can put in your questions in the chat, uh, in the chat uh, box. And I will review those questions as you come along. And uh, Mr. Secretary, you continue to inspire us. President Reif. Thank you, President Nunes. I, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. I'm delighted to be here, team. Thank you for organizing this event, this conversation. And President Nunez, thank you so much for moderating it. And, uh, and Secretary Kerry, let me tell you that it's an immense honor for me to be, uh, let me say, on the same screen with you having this conversation. I've long admired the work you've done in the Senate, uh, in climate change, and many other fronts, and in the State Department, and now as a private citizen. Um, what have we learned? Uh, you know, just a couple of very quick things. First, uh, in my view, with COVID, uh, we were unprepared. And, uh, and even when we started, uh, we were even unprepared to try to contain, mitigate, or even adapt to it, uh, see how the country is today compared to many other nations. So we were unprepared. And as Secretary Kerry said, uh, we didn't have to be unprepared and, and, and we do know enough about, about the situation and we could have done more. And my concern right now, the lessons learned is that we know about climate change, as Secretary Kerry said, we cannot possibly be unprepared. We have no excuse. And yet we are unprepared. Uh, things are happening and happening relatively rapidly and we're not doing much about it. So that's, that's our lesson number one. Connected with that is the fact that uh, we were unprepared because we don't accept the science. Uh, and, uh, and Secretary Kerry mentioned that point, and that is a serious matter. I mean, there are facts and we need to recognize them and act accordingly. And a very connected lesson in my view is, is, is the importance of research uh, and the importance of universities. It was amazing to see how American universities responding to COVID-19. Uh, they drop everything to try to help with solutions, to use science and advanced research. At MIT, they quickly came up with uh, very advanced, uh, uh, inexpensive ventilators that can be fabricated fairly quickly. They came up with novel ways to fabricate very quickly face shields to handle the crisis. They're working on, on, um, on, on, on tests, they're working on vaccines. They drop everything they were doing to move, the, to, move to solutions. That's because they understand the science. That is another example. Let's not forget that we have a force uh, in American institutions and universities who can, in the case of, of climate change, doesn't have to be an urgent uh, uh, requirement like it happened with COVID, like it is happening with COVID, but it is yet still urgent. And we have a tremendous capability to address uh, the mitigation and adaptation efforts that are needed and the climate models that are needed to really prepare us for the climate change that is happening already. And we cannot get, we have to avoid getting to that to the degree uh, C that uh, Senator Kerry mentioned a moment ago. Thank you, President Reif. <coughs> Sometimes, you know, it happens to me that I think about things in an abstract way and intellectually, it, you know, I process it. And then all of a sudden I have this aha moment and that happened to me, uh, when there was a report written about a community in Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Secretary, in which they, they wrote that the community had more uh, uh, people with the COVID virus, the, the community, more people were dying, the community was a poor community. And, and one of the things that uh, they reported was that people had higher rates of asthma, of course, upper respiratory, and that there was pollution in the area. And I went like this, oh my God, you know, issues of social justice and climate. There it is, right in my face. So when you think about George Floyd and his, you know, his killing, 
is murder, you, you, you think about issues of social justice. How have you, the two of you, and we'll start with you, President Rife, this time, how have the two of you thought about issues of social justice connected to, to climate? Well, it is very closely connected to climate and to COVID. I think, I think something really um, remarkable is ongoing right now, and, and it's tragic, but at the same time, it's remarkable. Um, I think society tolerated uh, for far too long uh, income inequality, economic inequality, uh, racial injustice and inequality, um, and then and then COVID happened. And, and, and then the George Floyd killing happened. And then very clearly that, 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 that inequality became so obvious and so, so, um, so dramatic. Uh, it's well known that COVID has attacked uh, much more heavily communities of color and poor communities. And, and I for, for, cannot doubt for a moment that climate change will do exactly the same thing. So, this, we're going through a transformation, I'm thinking, I'm hoping, and I think it's happening from a society that tolerated these inequalities in, in, in race and in economic um, uh, basis into a society that is much more sensitive to that and much less tolerant to those inequalities. And, and the reason uh, that that's important is because I expect that from now on, solutions, as we think of mitigation, adaptation, solutions for climate change, we must think how those will impact the inequality we have in our society because that cannot be acceptable anymore. And I think in the past, we may have addressed advances in technology or science or, or, or in political economy uh, without paying as much attention as we should have to inequalities. In the future, that can no longer be the case and we better start doing that with the climate change mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Secretary Kerry? Well, I, I, I think that uh, President Reif has hit the nail on the head uh, completely. Um, I have a daughter who is a critical care physician at Mass General Hospital. And as we speak right now, she is over there in the ICU working with COVID patients and so forth. They're down in their number, finally. They got, they're, they're much reduced in the pressure. But she told me that throughout the center of this crisis, most of their patients and most of the morbidity was in the Hispanic community and most of the patients coming in were from East Boston and Chelsea. Uh, it tells you the whole thing. And I think what uh, you look around the country, this is true. I mean, the, 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 the challenged minority communities of our country, generally speaking, have far less available health care, uh, even with Obamacare. Uh, it's astonishing that in the middle of that, a president would try to take it away from 27 million Americans, but that is what is happening. And um, the people without health care, whether it's, I mean, there are all kinds of conditions, obesity, emphysema, uh, cancer, uh, various uh, you know, prolonged illnesses, of one kind or another that weaken people. And, and that's principally where it's been, but it's also hit people that you thought were pretty healthy. And sometimes this, uh, this virus surprises and you can be walking around positive but not feeling a lot of symptoms and two days later you could be in a coma. Uh, so there's a lot we don't know about it, but we know it strikes minority communities, uh, poor people, poor folks, uh, much more than everybody else. I think that combined with George Floyd's murder uh, tapped into something that was already, I think, very real in the body politic of our nation. And that was a sense of, a deep sense of the inequality in our society that has grown and grown and grown in the last years uh, with the tax cuts, with the structure of the tax code, with the absolute gridlock of Washington on ideology and so forth. Uh, people have been very dissatisfied and this has now played into that dissatisfaction. Um, I think there will probably be a record turnout. I think there will be quite conceivably record change, but it isn't going to happen unless people are engaged and are, and are determined to make it happen. You can take nothing for granted. But clearly, uh, racism, the inequality of our nation, the poverty of our nation, 
the connectedness of that poverty to uh, to the uh, coronavirus and its impact uh, are going to be seared into the politics of our nation and should be for years to come. And it's gonna be incumbent on us to get as much reform and constructive change as is possible, as rapidly as possible. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. I enjoy my work with the Second Nature very much. Uh, I'm on their advisory uh, committee. And Tim Carter, I've come to really, really admire him as he's a scientist and he's thought deeply about these issues. But the one thing on a recent call that I was uh, a part of with him and others, uh, he, he expressed this frustration. And the frustration was that he, we were talking about something that we had talked about years and years ago, and here we are again talking about it again. And he said that. He said, here we are talking about higher eds, talking about this again, and how are we going to do things differently? So he, he has gotten me to think more systematically about building new higher education models. So if we are, higher ed is an institutional actor, how should we act? And Secretary Kerry, I will ask you to start. Well, wisely and with urgency. Um, I, and I don't say this lightly, but uh, there's no room for ivory towers anywhere in our country. The, 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 uh, we have lost validators of issues and solutions in our country over time. They've been discredited by inaction or by artificiality, by mendacity, so forth. Uh, and so uh, people in our country have a hard time figuring out who to believe and who they can listen to and who's trustworthy. And, uh, and I think that uh, this moment is one where we could regain, frankly. But it's going to take, academia's got to step up. Let me give you an example. Um, the scientists I talked to, and I just talked with a fellow named uh, Johann Rockström, who is a scientist in Germany, in Berlin. He's, he's Swedish, but he's running the Potsdam Institute. He t he'll give you some pretty dire realities, as will a lot of other people following the issue day to day, that tell you that if you're talking amongst knowledgeable people, we're not talking about 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees anymore. We're blowing past them. We're gonna blow past them. China's about to bring 21 gigawatts of, of coal-fired power online. And India's not far behind in that number. And then Malaysia and Indonesia and Vietnam. I've been working in Vietnam for three years to try to get them off of coal. China sells their dirty coal to Vietnam. So we need validators of these facts and of these choices. And I think the National Academy of Sciences, I think the, uh, the, the you know, independent school associations, all the various entities that exist, uh, cannot continue to view themselves as, as not front and center in helping to organize around the truth. Uh, we have, if, if we don't reclaim a capacity to referee the truth in our dialogue, so-called, in our society, our democracy is going to crumble, and who knows how many of these militia come out of the mountains, well armed as they are, or what the hell is going to happen? There's already been too much of that visible. So this is—I mean, I—I I don't mean to be dramatic about it. I've, I, you know, I've been 28 years a senator and privileged to be four years as Secretary of State, and fought in a war that should never have been fought. And I know the consequences of not making wise choices as well as anybody. And I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm just certain that this is a battle for our ability to be able to make things work here. And we need more voices compelling people to hew to the truth and to uh, uh, stand up to bullying and to uh, demagoguery. Uh, and I hope uh, that's gonna happen over these next months. The academic world of America, I mean, when Harvard and MIT and other institutions and, and Caltech and Berkeley and Stanford and all these people were to get together and start issuing a few 
solid statements about what's true or not or what we need to do or not, I think it'll begin to sober people up and begin to have an impact. And, and the other thing is, we got to begin to hold the politicians accountable. I've been one for a long time. I'll tell you, when people feel that they're staying in office is at risk, they move. In 1970, I was part of the first Earth Day. And we went out and got 20 million Americans out of their homes on the first Earth Day. And then we turned it into a political movement. We targeted the 12 worst votes in Congress. We defeated seven of them. And guess what? That's when we passed the Clean Air Act, safe drinking water, marine mammal protection, coastal zone management, the, the uh, Endangered Species Act. That's when we created the Environmental Protection Agency of our nation. So you've got to move the body politic. And we, we, you know, only 19% of people between the ages of 18 and 25 voted in 2016. Yeah. That's the story. And, and I think colleges, universities, and others have to do a better job of making sure their students understand what civic responsibility is all about. President Reif. Well, I, I, Secretary Kerry addressed that so well that I have a little to add, but, but let, let me try. I think, uh, I think there, is, there is something very important here um, uh, that, that can and should be addressed by higher education. If, if you look at mission statements of most universities, you will read that they say uh, something along the lines of advanced knowledge and educate students. And, and all universities agree that that should be their mission, advanced knowledge and educate students. Uh, there are very few, uh, and MIT is one of them, that also adds these words and, and bring knowledge to bear on the world's greatest challenges. In other words, don't stop by advancing knowledge, by doing research to advance knowledge in educate students. Just use that knowledge, do something good with it. And, and this, is, this is something that we're facing right now, a, a crisis, whether it's COVID or climate change, in which universities ought to play a key role. Um, what should we do right now? I think, I think clearly, uh, to begin with, we have to walk the talk in climate change. So we have to, we have to figure out how to keep reducing our carbon footprint institutionally, but also individually. I think, I think uh, institutions like us can work harder and, and quite frankly, spend even more money that right now is tight because of COVID, but we have to do it in terms of making buildings more efficient and the power plant distribution and generation more efficient from the climate change point of view, from the emission standpoint. We have to figure out how to optimize and minimize demand. All that has to be part of what we have to do in, in, uh, in higher education. Uh, but, but at the heart of it all, is actually what, what I said a moment ago. There is a force in higher education in many American universities of trying to be part of the solution. And part of the solution is not just educating students, it's also educating how to solve a, 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 a serious issue. And, and this is a very critical one we're facing in the US, we're facing it globally. Secretary Kerry mentioned about China and India. Even if we and this is what we have. Uh, we need much more help than just universities, although universities can do global collaborations. Even if we do a magnificent job uh, of reducing our emissions in the US, if we don't figure out a way how to work with India and China and Indonesia and so forth for them to lower emissions, we're still doomed in, in, in the planet, uh, planet the climate change. So these are very constructive roles academia can play. And, uh, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, we're more than eager to play that role. Thank you, President Reif. We have a question from one of our presidents who's in the audience, and I want to ask the two of you to respond. Uh, and we'll start with you, Secretary Kerry. It, there are people who don't believe that the, the, it's a reality of climate change, and they don't support effective policies. All the policies that you mentioned, Secretary Kerry, that you've uh, over your lifetime have been, you know, the leader and uh, such an effective public servant to to make it a better world for all of us. What what kind of scientific and behavioral approaches can we put out so that people begin to believe and then support the policies that are so important? And to you, President Reif, I would ask, um, do you think that MIT, the, the president is asking actually, do you think MIT has the diversity of faculty and researchers needed to provide the, some of these solutions? And we'll start with you, Secretary Kerry. Well, you're absolutely correct that uh, there's a gap 
But I think you have to look at and understand one of the principal reasons for that gap. Um, first of all, uh, I will assume some blame along with many other people in the environment movement for not having thought carefully enough in the very beginning about, about that message. So there was a lot of talk about ice and ice melting and you know not relating it uh, somehow to people's lives, polar bears moving and so on and so forth. Um, one of the reasons I put together this new organization called World War Zero is to bring together unlikely allies across the aisle, all of whom believe that climate change is a challenge. So we had a town hall in Columbus, Ohio, literally the week before COVID hit big and everything got shut down. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, Republican from California, who did a lot on climate as governor, and John Kasich, governor of Ohio, and I held this bipartisan, nonpartisan, apolitical statement of the facts, speaking to the people of Columbus, and it was obviously out on the internet. Uh, there has to be a new conversation in America, uh, in the world. And the conversation has to center around, I think, first of all, jobs. Uh, that's particularly relevant the consequence of COVID. I mean, what COVID has done is accelerated uh, things that were on the table for a lot of companies 10 years from now uh, and, and, and five years from now. And five years from now is already today. 10 years from now is going to be in five years or four years. Everything's moved up and accelerated. And I think that, uh, that President Reif would agree with me that uh, this, this COVID has forced us into this new paradigm to some degree. And a lot of companies are racing ahead on it. I mean, all these Zoom meetings and you know, distance uh, medicine and so forth. Anyway, bottom line, we have to open up that new conversation. And it centers around jobs and the economy. The economy of dealing with climate is not what the liars have told us. It is not what the obfuscators have told us. And I encourage anybody here, you're all you know, <laughs> teaching people and involved in, uh, in academia. Uh, Naomi Oreski is professor of history of science at Harvard has written a book called The Merchants of Doubt. And the Merchants of Doubt traces these scientists who began in the post-war period, the 1940s and 50s, uh, and they are the ones who actually savaged Rachel Carson on the subject of DDT and what science said about cancer and DDT. She ultimately won on the facts, but not after they tried to destroy her. 1960s, 70s, we saw flammable pajamas come under uh, assault, uh, the whole notion that they were flammable and people tried to duck it. The nicotine. We spent years fighting R.J. Reynolds and we saw all the documents that finally came out showing how there was a cover up and they knew what it was. and They kept selling it. Same thing with acid rain, same thing with ozone and the same thing now with climate and COVID. There is a, there, there are a bunch of folks who unfortunately are ready to perjure their science and go out there for money and promulgate things that they know are untrue. And even Exxon Mobil, even though the lawsuit turned out the way it did, knew, there's no question but that they knew uh, that this was gonna have a negative impact and they kept on doing it. So I think it's critical for us to get the narrative out there for people to see and feel the consequences. Now, mother nature is helping to make that happen now. Farmers are seeing what the floods are doing. We got a major drought uh, in the South still. We have uh, rainfall that is now so much more intense because of the warming of the oceans, increased moisture in the air, increased rainfall. That also doesn't just increase the rainfall, it increases the amount of brush that now survives and grows as tinder and you have worse fires. And, and so you can actually point to mudslides and fires and storms. We spent $265 billion in America, you spent, 265 billion cleaning up after three storms two years ago, Maria, Irma, and Harvey. And all of them were more intense, longer winds in Irma than ever before, 185 miles an hour for a sustained 24 hours. Harvey, more water dropped in five days than goes over Niagara Falls in an entire year. I mean, these are extraordinary events and most people in America can relate to them if they get a chance to hear about them. So you combine that with our security interests, 
uh, which are huge. We have General Stanley McChrystal, who headed our special forces. He's part of World War Zero. We have Admiral Lee Gunn, who was the head of policy and planning at the Pentagon. He'll tell you the military thinks it's a serious issue and a huge threat multiplier. And then finally, health. Health is critical. Lower the particulates, lower the pollution, less cancer, less disease, cleaner air, and so forth. So I think if we could change the dialogue and begin to uh, get different uh, messengers out there, depoliticize it, reinvigorate the legitimacy of the science, which is where MIT and others could play such an extraordinary role, then we have a chance of winning the battle of choice here. And the final thing is we have to show people how it, this does not a choice between having a good economy and having your current quality of life or something horrible and worse, which is what Trump tries to sell. He's so dead wrong. It's the exact opposite. Sir Nicholas Stern has written a book that, that quantifies the cost of not doing versus the cost of doing. And the cost of doing is so much less than the cost of not doing. Moreover, it changes your whole economy. If we had a virtuous grid in America, we don't even have a national grid for energy in the United States of America. East Coast grid, West Coast grid, Texas has its own grid, little line by the Dakotas. Come on, folks. We're the United States of America. We invented the internet. We went to the moon. We do incredible things. We're not being asked to, and we're not doing them. And so if we were to get about the business of innovation, we need the largest commitment to innovation and research and development in the history of humankind. And we have to let MIT and all these other great institutions unleash their creative energy, and we'll come up with the negative emissions technology or the uh, super battery. I mean, these things are all solvable. Maybe fusion will finally come through. Who the hell knows? But we got to get on that track, Elsa. And we're not, we don't have leadership that's asking America to do that. Joe Biden, I think in the energy thing that the campaign just put out, is putting those choices in front of the country. And, you know, we need, we need the academic world to help us create a base of citizens who are prepared to make the right choices. That was always the premise of Second Nature. Second Nature was founded with the premise that we want these choices to be second nature to people. Why? Because they grew up learning about this in the course of their education. Yeah. Thank you for reminding us of that. I had, I had lost that idea. Thank you. President Reif. Well, I, I strongly agree that, that we somehow have to work on some kind of a new kind of narrative campaign about climate change, because clearly uh, we have the facts, we have the science, uh, we have been factual when we communicate to the public, uh, but some fraction of the public is not understanding it and not accepting it, and, 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 and we need to do a better job in our narrative. Uh, uh, academia has to play a role, but we need we need to figure out how to actually reach out to people in in what ways. Uh, uh, Secretary Kerry mentioned about not just a, a, a message, but also messengers. is is complicated. It's not simple, but we do need to do a better job at having a narrative on climate change to reach the general public. On the very precise question about MIT. Look, I don't think MIT is much different than any other higher education institution in the country in the following way. Our students, our youth, the students who are in the campus around me right now, uh, actually not right now, they were here four months ago, uh, our students are angry at our generation. They are all angry at us. And I don't think these are just the MIT students. These are the students in every American campus. Why? because we are messing up the planet that they're inheriting from us. So they are angry at us and they want us to do something or to enable them to do something. And what Secretary Kerry spoke about, about creating a zero emission technologies or negative emission technologies or a, or, a, or a fusion and all that, they want to do that. They want the tools to do that and, 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 and or the opportunity to explore and research that. And this is what we're not doing in America. We're not we're not supporting, we're not creating the funds to create that kind of future. So the issue is not so much do we have the people who want to do it, 
the faculty and students at MIT, and I can assure you, in almost every American campus that does research, they want to be part of the solution. But they want to, they need to be invited and they need, we need to put resources for them to actually be part and come up with that solution. Thank you, President Reif. Another question that we have from one of the uh, presidents in the audience, which I, which I have thought a lot about, which is we as presidents can be, um, can take public positions and provide leadership on, on climate. Many of us don't, and that's because uh, other things are on our plate. What advice might the two of you give uh, presidents about making climate uh, rise on the top of our list so that we can be the public voice um, uh, for change? And Senator Kerry, uh, Senator Kerry, Secretary Kerry, would you please uh, respond first? Well, I'm, 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 I'm not a president of the university, and I know how hard being a president of the university is, and uh, it's, a, it's a really tough, tough job for so many reasons. So I, I don't want to complicate it with some simplistic answer that says you've got to go out and, you know, speak out and so forth. I, I think you do have to, but I also know you've got to weigh the realities of running your campus and raising money and, mm -hmm. and, and providing the programs. But I do think there's strength in numbers. Uh, I think that, you know, you, uh, university presidents should not feel alone on this kind of topic. And I think if there were a greater coordination between everybody, then there'd be greater strength in, in, in you're the messengers. And there will be strength in the numbers of those messengers that will help uh, to change some of the attitudes, but I'm not saying you have to fall on your sword every single day or every year, or every month. But there are times, folks. I mean, we're getting to a crisis now. You know, Dante reminded us that the hottest places for hell, in hell, are reserved uh, for those who, in times of great moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. And this is not a time for neutrality. It is a time of moral crisis. And so I, I, I would hope that, you know, sometimes you have to make those choices. Colin Kaepernick gave up his career by kneeling and leading a movement, and they didn't let him play. Would you lose a few bucks? Probably. But in the long measure of things, I think you'd have a student body that'll make up for it over time as they go out and save the world. President Reif. Yeah, well, I have a very, very, uh, I, I, I'm free to express my strong views. Secretary Kerry was very respectful of not saying something uh, in front of uh, college presidents, but, but I, 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 I can be a little more um, uh, 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 strong on that. I, I strongly believe, I mean, I think there are some lines that college presidents should not cross because college presidents represent their college. So, uh, you cannot really take a political position. You cannot favor a Republican point of view because many in your college may not be Republican. So that there are lines that you really have to be careful not to cross. Uh, but sir, there are some issues that are not political. And I think climate change is one of them. It has been politicized, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And that's, that's a, a, a huge trick that has done a disservice to the nation, to the world. Climate change should not be politicized, like, just like COVID should not be politicized. Climate change is happening. And to speak up about that is not being political. So I strongly encourage for college presidents to do that. Uh, there was an issue that now is also being politicized, the, 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 how we welcome, for example, international students. Uh, that was a line that was crossed, and, and, and even though that's a line that I would prefer not to cross when it comes to arguing with the government, that was just so bizarre, uh, so, so strange that it, something had to be done. So I think I do understand the position of being careful because you represent a large segment of faculty, students, and trustees who may be very upset if you make a point of view that does not represent them. So trying to avoid being political is one thing, but speaking up on something that is real and is a fact, that is our jobs. We as college presidents has to speak in favor of the facts. If we don't do it, who's gonna do it? So true. We are running out of time, so I'm gonna ask the two of you to respond uh, about- Literally. 
<laughs> yes, literally and figuratively. Uh, we are, uh, you know, in a position now to see that the COVID crisis is going to be with us for some time. And we know that uh, the climate crisis is continuing to worsen. It depresses all of us. And so when you think about the th maybe three things that it, universities can do uh, to, to push us forward so that when the three of us are talking again in a year, we're not seeing that very little progress has been made or that we're stuck in the same place. How, how do we push the sector forward so that we can make uh, an impact uh, that will create this change that is so sorely needed in this country? And President Reif, I'll start with you. Thank you, President Nunez. Well, uh, three things you said. Uh, well, look, colleges are about education and advancing knowledge, as I said, uh, and, and also about walking the talk, uh, just, just, just to do what we say, not just to ask others to do what we say. So I think, uh, to me, I'm hoping that, that we can do and we can be given the resources through government funding or through philanthropy to do more the research that is needed for us to try to avoid the two degree C disaster. I think that's my biggest wish, my biggest hope, that a year from now we're in a much better shape advancing, not just MIT, but all universities or many of them in the country who want to play a role, advancing the science so that we can better prepare ourselves and mitigate and maybe even have to adapt to climate change, number one. Number two, we do need to bring to the public uh, the education we do to our students. We need to educate our students to join that workforce that will handle climate change. We need to pre prepare them for that. But goodness gracious, we need to also play a role somehow to tell people outside the world of academia, outside those who are students or college graduates, those who are there who don't quite get it or believe it, we need to figure out how to explain it to them for them to understand how serious the situation is. And, and, um, and thirdly, I think we have to walk the talk. I think uh, we as an institution, every one of us, and as individuals in the institution ought to commit to reduce our carbon footprint. It's not, it's not enough to go and tell and point at a college president and say, you institution, reduce your carbon print because we have to do it and we're doing it. We also have to ask each one of us, each members of our institutions, what are you each individually doing to reduce your carbon footprint? We all have to do that. And I think those are the three things that I can think of right off the bat that would be very important for all of us to commit to. Those are very helpful. Secretary Kerry, what advice? Well, I think I, I agree with everything that uh, President Rice said. I think first and foremost, uh, every campus, every university has got to be moving towards full sustainability. Uh, and they've got to have a plan and a program and, a, and they've got to meet the dates which the rest of the world is being asked to try to meet with respect to decarbonizing, but also not just decarbonizing, there's a whole lot of different kinds of pollution uh, and, and also impacts on the community. The, the, uh, the relationship between town and gown uh, the level of uh, endowment uh, measured against uh, the local relationship, if you will. I think there are a set of things there that could profoundly impact uh, the country uh, and uh, communities and help set an example. Secondly, is on the R&D front, uh, pushing the curve, demanding from Washington, uh, creating the consortia that I talked about, uh, so that the voices leave no space for anybody to believe that this is political or, or ideological. Uh, I think that could be ramped up very, very significantly. And um, I, I would urge uh, uh, people to do that. I think that it would have an enormous impact. I think, I mean, those are the things that I think would have the, the biggest impact. Thank you. It's interesting because they see MIT and you, President Reif, we see you as the, the voice of technology and Secretary Kerry, we see you as the voice of public policy. So is that okay or should we be working more in sync? No, I don't think you should separate them at all. I, I'm, I'm a believer, I mean, technology has produced most of the productivity increases of our world and of our nation 
over these last 30, 40 years. Um, technology is probably going to be the way we resolve. Uh, we, we actually wind up doing this. No government is going to solve climate change. Climate change can be herded by governments and, and, and corralled and, and uh, we can create the construct through tax credits, through tax incentives, through grants, through various programs. We did that in Paris when, when we did the Paris Agreement. We put together a $100 million program. We got Bill Gates. We got a bunch of people. We persuaded Prime Minister Modi to take over uh, uh, on this uh, mission innovation. And what we need are 10 times the mission innovation right now. And, and I think we, we can get there. I really believe it. Someone's going to have the battery breakthrough. Someone's going to produce that battery, and they'll be the new Bill Gates, uh, Sergey Brin, Elon Musk, whatever. That's going to happen. Somebody's going to find a way to, uh, to create a virtuous cycle on hydrogen fuel. I'm convinced of it. Uh, and if we can produce the hydrogen fuel, we have plenty of hydrogen, but we got to be able to produce it with less energy intensity. We can do that. Someone will do that. And so I think uh, universities need, need to be pushing that as hard as possible. Um, the, I was in Iceland recently, and they're, they're taking a liquid. I don't know what all the components of the liquid are, but they pour it into the basalt, and there's largely basalt for the island there, and uh, it turns into stone. It's a different way of storing carbon. Uh, I don't know what the breakthrough, I mean, these are hard things. Carbon capture is expensive, it's difficult, but I do know that when we humans put our minds to the task and we apply ourselves with ingenuity and creativity and unlimited good budget, we know how to get things done. We've proven it. Uh, the internet didn't come about because we set out to make an internet, it's because we needed a way to communicate in case of an a, atomic war, you know, a, a nuclear war. And it evolved into this other thing. How much came out of space that is now in people's kitchens that's the America that does this. That is not the America we are today. And if we get back to that, I believe we can, uh, we can deal with this problem. I really do. I personally, I get in a lot of trouble with some environmental friends on this, but I think fourth generation modular nuclear, which is zero emissions, if we'd start building 10 or so demonstration plants, we should at least put that to the test. And I say that because as a Navy guy, having spent four years in the Navy, we've had nuclear ships for over 60 years, 70 years. We've never had an accident. We never lost a sailor. We've never had a meltdown. And you can look at each of the instances of nuclear problem and you can have a way of explaining, you know, you know what happened. Uh, I mean, Chernobyl wasn't even a nuclear reactor. It was a nuclear research center. So we've got to get smarter about how we're going to approach this, and hopefully universities will help us do that. Okay. And hopefully I didn't open a whole can of worms here. <laughs> <laughs> not. You inspire us. And President Reif. Well, I think I, think, uh, I fully agree that these, these two things go together, policy and technology. Let me just tell you what I, I – it's a very simple recipe in my mind. We need policies that are incentives – uh, for individual behavior and for institutional behaviors. Uh, we have policy incentives that, that, that incentivizes companies to take existing technologies and make them better and less expensive. And those are really accomplished through policy and we need those. At the same time, we need technologies that are gonna get us to the future. We need the technologies of the things Secretary Kerry was talking about with passion. We need zero emission technologies, we need negative emission technologies. We need new things if we're gonna avoid climate change and mitigate it. So they all go together. We need the incentives to advance as fast as we can with what we know today, but we need to create a new know-how that we don't have right now and Secretary Kerry is right. If we put our minds to it, we will get there. But we need the resources, the funding to be able to get there. Thank you. So, Secretary Kerry, our country, our citizens of this country are very grateful to you for the legacy you have left as a public servant. And now you continue that legacy as a private citizen. You've inspired us, we admire you, we respect you, and we are very grateful to you. You could have done many things with your life and to serve our country in the way you have uh, in the military and in public service uh, is admirable. And we are, we are very, very fortunate that you well, are- Well, thank you, you're very generous with that, but it, it's been a privilege, it's a privilege. So I don't, that's fine. 
and President Reif, you're leading one of the world's greatest universities and you've brought to it a special vision. And it is, it is and it will always be a great university, but you've expanded its vision to include people from modest backgrounds and issues related to the poor. And I think people are sitting up and, and looking at MIT in a different way because of your leadership. It is an exemplary position and you are an exemplary president and we are all very grateful to you that you have made your vision so expansive uh, and so uh, connected to issues of social justice and you inspire each of us. Thank you for your leadership at MIT. You're very kind, President Nunez, you're very kind, thank you. Thank you. And so with that, we're going to wrap up. It's two o'clock. I don't know how I did it, but I'm on time. <laughs> Puerto Ricans usually are late. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I learned a lot. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. We recorded this session.